welcome, welcome to the long and the short of it. I am your ever-present host, Jennifer Wren. This is episode number eight, and my goodness, this is our second to last episode. Can you believe it? It was a limited run series, and we are almost to that final lap. I could not be more excited. So one of the things you don't know, because I look exactly how I look every week, as I'm actually live casting tonight out of my new house. Uh, this is the green screen I always use, but we are in a new separate room. I have a room of one zone instead of the dining room. And I'm kind of excited about that. Might be a little echoey, but that's because there's no furniture or carpets because, hey, I just moved in. On that note, I am gonna bring in my ever-present, fantastic, delightful co-hostess with the most S, Beth Hickey, um, our resident wine expert and someone who is absolutely dear to my heart. Um, she is up there in wild, wild Seattle as usual. Beth, how are you doing? I am great. I am great. It's actually, well, this is uh, Roussillon in France. Yes. And outside in Seattle, it's actually very dark and very rainy. <laughs> Lame. I, you know, it has gotten a little colder here in LA recently. We're down in the 40s, which is, you know, for LA or is it practically the, the Arctic. But yep. uh, God, the landscape behind you looks so beautiful. I cannot wait to talk about this wine tonight. I know. I'm super excited as well. And I have not been to this part of the world, but right now I, I really miss travel. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. It was funny. I was talking to a fella um, in the Highlands today and he was like, oh, have you been here? And I was like, oh, I've, I've been there like seven times. And uh, I just miss it so much. And all my dear friends who are, who are on the continent, it's been too long since I have seen them. Um, but, I mean, we can be just, if you've been able to travel, just be grateful for those memories. Oh my gosh. Right. Right. And it's so funny, Beth, because tonight, you know, you and I talk about fashion. We're going to talk about a little bit tonight, some more fashion, but we are wearing the same dress. Like, yeah. I mean, obviously very different style or very different pattern, but it was so funny because I was like, high collar, it's the, it's the winter. Can I do high collar? Uh-huh, yes. high collar season. <laughs> oh, you look fantastic. You look so beautiful, like Twiggy or something. Oh, well, it is a vintage 1960s uh, lanvin. Mm. And it's a sweater dress. I've been a little under the weather today and oh. needed some color. So I thought kind of this crazy printed little sweater dress and some uh, shocking pink uh, lipstick would, you know, set me right for at well, least. <laughs> you, look, you look stunning. Thank you. For, for someone who's a hair under the weather, you look like a million dollars. <laughs> and I mean, you kind, kind of always do. It must be that, that wine glow that's just about you. <laughs> So tonight we have a guest that is very dear to my heart. I mean, and I want to say all of our guests are very dear to my heart, but this is a person who has been a friend of mine for over a decade. I met back in New York City during my performing days, back when I was an actress, and um, has followed my career in spirits uh, as well, uh, because he is incredibly well-versed in spirits. And I'm going to go ahead and bring him on. And this is our guest tonight, the handsome the dapper, the vintage lifestyle, um, Mr. Don Spiro. My goodness gracious. Hello, sir. How are you tonight? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm great. So Don is coming to us from the East Coast. This is our second East Coast guest in two weeks. Um, Don, how, how is it out there in New York City right now? Uh, well, actually, um, if, if you're going outside, it, it's been nice. We had a week of strange 70 degree weather uh mm. everybody was going out because we know very soon we're not going to be allowed to to go out very much yeah. um today it dropped down to the 40s and 50s and it's been raining and it's supposed to rain all week so people are trying to go out as much as possible because they are they are having more uh restrictions last night they changed it so bars and restaurants that were open to 11 now had to close at 10 o'clock um oh limit it to uh, groups of no more than 10 people. So uh, what, what I've been telling my friends and what my wife and I are doing is trying to go out um, as much as possible, uh, safely, uh, socially distant, but to support you know, the, the local uh, cafes and restaurants and bars and, and people because uh, winter's coming here. And I know that in Los Angeles, you're not gonna have blizzards, but we, we're looking to maybe have a bad winter 
And we're hoping a lot of these places can survive through till, you know, February and March. You know, John, that's that's such a realness. I mean, I think that that's, that's going to happen most likely in um, Seattle, too, where you guys are going to have some really brutally cold weather. I mean, God knows, Beth, I've come to visit you in Seattle and it's it's just kicked my butt, you know, because <laughs> it's very cold and very humid, much like New York City. Um, but, you know, that, that's that's a truth. I mean, we're going to probably have it's going to be pretty mild. I mean, it's not it's not like bikini weather. But, um, you know, it's going to be interesting how different people in different parts of the country are, are dealing with COVID. Um, Don, you know, this is a funny question. I used to do this when I lived in New York City because the light, and Beth, for that matter, do you guys have a, a um, what is that called, a UV ray box? Do you, do you have one of those little sunshine boxes? No, no, I don't. I hadn't actually heard of that. No, yeah, it's, it's a thing I'm, where there's no light. Yeah, no, I'm a actually a, a goth chick at heart. So I embrace the darkness and I write my poetry. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I, so I'm going to do something in reverse tonight. So I, I, I apologize to everyone watching. I'm a bit scatterbrained from the move, but I'm going to talk about your bio for just one second, Don. Um, I mean, I, I know your bio very well, but you know, you actually lived out here in LA for decades working in the TV and film industry. Um, I know that you've, you've done a ton of photography ranging from burlesque to on set photography. Um, you've also bartended at one of the most famous former speakeasies in New York, uh, that originally belonged to Texas Guinan, um, flute, which was a, a, a reimagined version of her speakeasy. Um, but the, the way I know you and, and the, the way that you sort of lead this dance is that you have been part of the, the vintage lifestyle um, and you have testified before Congress to promote the vintage agenda. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, a lot of that grew out of my um, my time in Los Angeles, because when I was living there, Los Angeles is one of those places that they don't have revival so much as different genres, different communities that started many years ago, decades ago, just never went away. Uh, you know, like the rockabilly scene, always been there. You know, the, the, the uh, Northern Soul scene, always been there. And the, the jazz age scene, it was, a lot of people just never stopped playing the old time jazz age music. And I also used to go to this uh, place called Brick Tops, which was like a German, French, Parisian 1920s cabaret. And when I went to New York, nobody was really doing anything like that. And I wanted to go. So just started doing it and found out there was a lot of other people who liked uh, either to, you know, dress up in vintage or just dress up nice mm -hmm. for a night on the town. Uh, people who liked vintage cocktails, people who liked the jazz music, people who did swing dancing. Uh, so for seven years that there, there was this bar, it used to be Club in Team back in the, the speakeasy days. Now it's uh, a champagne bar called Flute, like, like champagne flute. Uh, and I was bartending there. But we did this uh, once a month. And, and part of it was because of my lifestyle working in film and television where I would get grungy and dirty working 12, 14 hours a day wearing jeans or, or khakis and t-shirts. Uh, the end of the night, we just wanted to come home, shower, put on a nice suit and go out and have cocktails. So we were, we were the opposite of people who had to wear a suit all day and can't wait to change into something comfortable when they get home, we were wearing crap all day and couldn't wait to dress up when we got home. So that's how I got into it. And there's a big scene in New York now um, of all the people who just like to dress up nice. Um, it's also great for thrifting. You can save money by vintage shopping. And it, it's just a worldwide community almost now. I love that. Well, you know, Beth, I mean, one of the things that we've, an ever present theme on the long and short of it is your incredible vintage style. You have quite the collection. Do you, do you have an idea of uh, the range of your collection from like decade to decade? So um, the oldest that I have is Victorian. I, and it's where it's, everything I have is wearable. So I have uh, one Victorian piece. I have two Edwardian pieces and the Edwardian dress is very uh, Downton Abbey. I love this and it needed some work and I was happy to do some sewing because I, I can do that. Um, just don't ask me to knit. That's where I lose my mind. Everything else, I'm good. Um, 
but that was before zippers. I, I mean, it don't, I mean, I knew that intellectually, but when I put it on, I was just realized it was so handmade that it required little hands or patient hands to put this dress on. And I had to have my middle child help button everything because it was just a series of different sets of um, buttons or little hooks and eyes and whatnot, and it was just insane. So I have that going up to, um, for vintage for me ends in the 70s. I, was I born love in the, that. So I don't consider the 80s vintage. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have that, I have bad news for you. Uh, the 80s <gasps> are vintage, which makes me vintage. <laughs> I know it's terrible. It's like all of a sudden when you're when you're like, oh, remember the oldie station that played 30 year old music and it was the 50s music when you were a kid and now it's the 80s music. I, well, the 80s, I love the music of the 80s. So don't, that's I mean, yes. that to me. But I will say that my favorite vintage for fashion is the 40s. Mm. Um, my great grandmother's was a whack and she was the secretary for General MacArthur in the Philippines. And um, I just imagine like, I got I got actually all of her jazz vinyl um, just the suits, that military, um, the precision and just kind of very clean lines and the belting. I just, it's, that's my favorite. So this is a little wild for me, kind of, you know, crazy 60s mod lawn bun, but the 40s is my, yeah. So Don, what would your uh, personal decade of choice be? I have an idea, but I'm not sure. Oh, geez. Um... It's, it's really hard to say. I think I look best in 20s or 30s clothing, even though I have a lot of 40s. Um, as, as far as style goes, uh, my best decade to actually, like if I could go back to any decade, it would be uh, right now, because on eBay and in thrift stores, I can go, go get everything. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, and I've worn everything from Victorian up until like modern day, but I think I look best in like the 20s, 30s, 40s. And that is, I know that is a big range, uh, but that style I think is classic. Like I can go out in it and not everybody even sees me wearing vintage. That's so like, oh, it just looks like a nice suit because men's styles don't really, you know, that style doesn't really change all that often. That's a really fair point because I think that, you know, um, one of the challenges I have with with my uh, male identified colleagues in whiskey is I'm I'm always like, well, what's the dress code? And they're like, suit. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but you don't understand. You can wear a suit to a casual daytime wedding, or you can wear a suit to a cocktail party at 10 p.m. But that is very different for what's appropriate that I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. um, and and it is quite challenging to be a female identified femme presenting kind of and like and like have the right skirt length. Like it's challenging. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, I think I think there's something about a classic 20 suit that's just on point. Um, gosh, I guess I have to name one now. I mean, I would say probably I love the 20s, but unfortunately, I'm not flat chested, so most of that doesn't look very good on me. Um, I would say probably the 40s and 50s fit me the best, but not always my my style. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of rocking. This is sort of like I feel like 60s, 70s is kind of working it's, for me right now. It's, it's a bit 60s. Yeah, it's a bit 60s. And, and this is a very long dress. So it's, it's, you're just only seeing the top of it. But, you know, I think it's so fascinating, um, these ideas of who we, uh, who we are born as and who we choose to be. Um, that's always been something that's very interesting to me since I have a fake name. Some people don't know that. Um, but that being said, we are about the hour when it's time to talk about our pairing for the evening. Now, this is what's so crazy. Even though Don's an old friend of mine, I didn't really know what Don was up to until about, I don't know, 20 minutes ago. So it's going to be a very interesting evening as we bring all of these pairings together. So for those of you who've been watching the show, you know that for the first six episodes, we did the entire Dalmore Principal Collection. So we went like 12, 15, 18, Cigar Malt, Portwood, all the way up to King Alexander. So the whiskey that I'm talking about tonight actually has some direct DNA to King Alexander. You may have noticed if you watched last week's episode that the master blender for Jura, which is to my left on screen, to my right in reality, <laughs> stage left, um, is uh, overseen by an incredibly fantastic and younger talented whiskey maker, Mr. Greg Glass. Greg was a protege of the Dalmore's master blender and whiskey maker, Mr. Richard Patterson. 
So if you watch last week's episode, you saw the King Alexander III. And the King Alexander III, when it was released, had the most finishing casts of any single mall ever created. And that was six. And that is a lot to handle when you are working with six different barrels and they're all maturing at the same time. And you have to blend it back together to make an incredible whiskey. That is super difficult. Well, Greg decided to one up his teacher. So tonight we are going to be drinking the Jura, there we go, Jura Sevenwood. It is seven separate maturation, additional maturation casks. And what Greg did that's slightly different from what Richard did, Richard pulled from wine, he pulled from port, he pulled from sherry. What Greg wanted to do because he's obsessed with wood and specifically forest conservation in Europe is he decided to do a walking tour of France and choose virgin wood from all of these very famous regions of France and really investigate what these wood casks would do to a single malt. So I just want to reiterate, these casks did not have wine in them, but each of them are from a specific wine growing region of France. So the idea behind this whiskey, it is a 42%, so just a little bit, 2% higher than the required 40% for a single malt. It starts its life in ex-bourbon American oak. And remember at Jura, we always blend a peated and an unpeated whiskey and we bring them together. And in this case, we bring these whiskeys together before this additional maturation process. So the additional maturation process divides the whiskey into seven separate virgin French wine casks. Now, when I say wine casks, I wanna reiterate, didn't have wine in them, but from wine growing regions. It is divided into separate, seven separate parts and then brought back together. So let's see if I can do this. These seven separate finishing casks and judge my French, please, Beth, um, <laughs> are <laughs> Jupia, Trancé, Le Betrange, Lemessin, Allier, American Oak, Vosges, and I'm missing, nope, that's seven, I got all of them. So let's do that again. It is Jupia, Trancé, Le Betrange, La Messin, Allier, Virgin American Oak, and Vosges. Now, what does that mean? It means when we are approaching this particular whiskey, and, and Don, I know you were sipping some out there in New York. Mm -hmm. I like to say, it reminds me, it's redolent of a Japanese whiskey. And why do I say that? Well, a lot of times in single malt, you're going to get notes of a clover or a fresh fruit or all kinds of things. But this particular whiskey, and I think it is coming from these French oak casks, almost has this, this note of white flower, like a gardenia or a jasmine. You don't typically find that in a single malt. And the second thing is because remember, this comes from the tiny island distillery on the island of Jura in the Inner Hebrides, you also have maritime influence, you have peat influence, and you have that distillery character that comes in the Jura of that bright, fresh green apple. Mm -hmm. So these French wine casks are going to be affecting that bright, fresh green apple and bringing these floral notes. This whiskey is very complex. It is very difficult to, to parse. It is very difficult to, to, to take apart and put back together. Um, and as usual, I love to do this to Beth. I just like to throw down, girl, like seven separate casts, man. And we asked you to pair one of the Elevage Collection wines with this. Um, and I cannot wait. And I had this rule, I said this earlier off camera. I never try the pairing before we start the show, because I always want to be surprised because Beth just keeps knocking it out of the ballpark. So what have you paired with Jura 7 Wood, Beth? So I have, to pair, or I have paired with this, the Department 66 Grenache. It is made by Dave Finney of Orin Swift. Um, and this is his property in Roussillon in Maureen. It's Grenache, this particular wine is Old Vine Grenache, uh, it's 10 to 65 years of age. 
in 2008, basically with the money he made off selling the prisoner, which slightly successful wine, you may have heard of it. Um, he decided to buy a winery in France. <laughs> and um, so at this point, it's 300 acres of estate grown vines, uh, most are dry farms. So Grenache, Syrah, Mabed, uh, Carignan. And Roussillon, um, well, this is a picture that I actually, I stole from Decanter because I didn't have a picture of the vineyards for Department 66. So on the other side of these mountains is Spain. So that's where you are in France. Um, essentially you have just, it, it's, it's arid. You can see they're just like the, these old vines. It'd be very similar to if you're looking at Dave's property. Um, dry farmed, just really concentrated Grenache grapes. Um, so this wine, if you're looking at blue and purple fruit, cassis, plum, very silky texture. And I chose this to pair with the, the scotch whiskey um, because the peat aspect, even though Jura just has that kiss of peat, it's a bit of a challenge for wine. So I wanted a wine, as I did last week, a wine that has rich concentrated fruit to kind of match that dance with the peat. So to meet it on the mid palate, and then as you go to the, the finish, you're still dancing. And you, there's not a conflict per se on the palate. So that's where I went with this, because it just, that's my angle with the peat, is to find the fruit to it that wants to dance with it. I love that because, uh, you know, um, even though Jura is only 15 ppm in the bottle. So the, the, yeah. the pit of whiskey that we make is in the 50s. But once we bring it together, it's down to 15 ppm. But the irony is a lot of people don't realize that phenolic notes that come from peat are actually sweet notes. They're, they're not just band-aid or they're not just medicinal. They actually have a sweet quality. And depending on where you, you're mining this peat in the land, you get a sweeter peat or a less sweet peat. Um, but Ev, I mean, Beth, okay, I've only done the double guns. Now, now, Don, I invite you to do this. I call it the double guns. And you try it both nostrils. So okay. the first thing I'm noticing here is that one of the backbones of Jura in general, when we talk about, uh, excuse me, Jura 7 wood in general, is the Vosges. And the Vosges brings this milk chocolate note to the whiskey and, and your wine, this incredible wine is enhancing that milk chocolate note. So it's coming across as a milk chocolate covered cherry. Mm. I mean, it is fantastic, Beth. Mm. I haven't drunk it yet. So uh, Don, are you noticing anything in the aroma? Is there anything you're picking up? Yeah, actually um, I'm picking up what you were mentioning, uh, but also because uh, my wife and I have been drinking the, the whiskey for, for several days and we just opened the wine tonight to have dinner and imme I immediately noticed the like a darker fruiter notes and she right away said cherry. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that she mentioned was, oh, this wine is, is the whiskey version of this scotch. So it, it seemed very much like, oh, well, yeah, Beth nailed it because when I bring them up to my nose, they just kind of blend together to me into one, uh, one aroma. I couldn't agree more. And actually, we were joking earlier, the tagline was, um, my wife doesn't even like whiskey and she liked this, which I was like, yes, <laughs> we've converted her. It's amazing. Um, but thank you for her for her notes. And I, I couldn't agree more. And so, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna take a sip of the whiskey and of the wine. It's a really good whiskey. <laughs> See, the wine sees aging as 30% new French oak. Yes. You are getting that, that cardamom, those sweet baking spices. And I, I picked that, or I picked this wine not only for the fruit, but also that oak influence because it is the seven wood. There is that, mm -hmm. you know, that baking spice influence. Right. And the, and the wood in this, in this mix is omnipresent. You, you cannot talk about this particular whiskey without talking about the wood influence and everyone brings something to the table. Um, I actually have this fantastic little thing that we built uh, for the whiskey that shows every single barrel and whether it was bringing a floral note, whether it was bringing a lemon note or a chocolate note. And um, I, you know, the only problem I have honestly with Jura 7 wood 
is I love to make whiskey cocktails. And this is a very difficult one to make in a cocktail because it is so damn complex mm. and you have to treat it very gingerly. You can't just like toss it into anything. Um, and, you know, but I mean, I, I just think it's such a, a piece of art on its own, but I do love the fact just to reiterate that Greg had to outdo his master by one. <laughs> it always makes me laugh. Um, and Greg Glass himself is a total pleasure. And the last time he came to the U.S. was in December of last year. And I uh, got to spend some time with him and really learn about his approach to peat. But yes, I mean, anytime we're doing these pairings, we never want one to outshine the other. The goal is always the conversation, the dance. And God, Beth, you've done it again. How do you do this? How do you do this? Well, for those of you who have been watching the series, as I always say, the joke here is I am the short shot of whiskey because I am just under 5'2", and Beth is the long, tall drink of wine because you are coming in at 6'2"? Is that accurate? No, I'm six foot. Six foot. Okay, that's still outdoing me by several inches. But we always have this amazing, amazing third guest that brings their expertise to the table. And tonight, Mr. Don Spiro, what are you pairing with the beautiful wine and this beautiful whiskey? Ah, okay. Well, first of all, I, I do want to say that these are just gorgeous. And I love that this is, uh, at least to me, it was more on the drier side because I don't like things overly sweet. When I have, um, like, I would prefer not making an old fashioned with this. I would prefer this just sipping it as, as it is. And I agree with you, making a cocktail would be very difficult. Although, I'm gonna try one, but first, <laughs> as far as pairings go, one of the things I do is as, as um, a modern event producer in New York City, um, I like to do things that have a lot of variety, um, uh, especially since I personally don't really have any skills, uh, would translate to, to something like this, you know. Um, but uh, in addition to being in that like, vintage scene, I uh, help edit a small press magazine called Zelda, which caters to like the vintage community. And there's how to's in there. And one of the how to's, which um, I mentioned to Jen and amused her was uh, speed lacing for, for shoes. Now, this goes back to mentioning what my favorite decade might be. And another thing, why, why I like living in these times is that I can pair things. I can uh, wear a 1930s or 40s suit with a 1920s or Victorian vest, or I can put on a 1950s or modern fedora and mix it all up and match all, all up. And one of the, the shoes I like to wear is a shoe like this. This is a modern shoe, but it's based on uh, Victorian styles and it's never been out of style. And I had a friend who had this in a really high knee length boot and she never wore it because it took so long to, to lace it up. And I said, no, it's, it's really easy. And if I, if I had two and we're on the floor, uh, I could show you how to do it one hand, just reach down with each hand and zip it up. But it's almost like a zipper with a zigzag. You grab the shoelaces there uh, in your fingers like that. And you can just go across And if this is really long, you can go all the way up and there you are. It's ah. really cool. Um, so dumb little skill that I have that, uh, you know, can just throw on my shoes, take them off really fast. But the other thing I wanted to really pair with this stuff was, um, you know, being in New York uh, and having a whiskey and a wine. And like you said, that it's, you know, what could you do with a cocktail for this? Well, I used to do all these jazz age parties where we would have prohibition era cocktails and I'm in New York. So one of my go-to cocktails then was the New York sour, which uh, I made one just before this and it's, it's been um, diluting a little bit, but it's just <laughs> two ounces of whiskey and then uh, an ounce of fresh squeezed lemon juice, uh, three quarters ounce for half an ounce of simple syrup, and then just a half ounce float of uh, wine on top. And because of the flavors of these two, it just blends together really well. I didn't use any bitters or any egg white or anything like that. But um, as far as sours go, it's a really nice, elegant, complex uh, version of a New York sour made with 
with scotch instead of uh, American whiskey. And this is a great cocktail to do something that I like to do because I'm in, you know, this community in New York uh, and it's just listen to jazz, have a nice cocktail, listen to jazz. And I have a lot of friends who I'd like to plug uh, some specifically, but more about, you know, what they do. If, if you're, whatever town you're in, uh, have a cocktail and go online and buy some, I've got some CDs from local performers. Uh, these are performers who I performed at my clubs, uh, like the Green Fairy, which I do now is an absent tasting party. I've got Queen Esther, I can put her on, uh, Mike Davis and the New Wonders, and then Glenn Kreitzer, who's gonna be performing at uh, my Repeal Day party show, uh, has a, a Christmas album out. So this is all New York uh, local traditional jazz bands. If, if you're in LA, you can listen to you know Janet Klein. Uh, I know Washington State, uh, Seattle has a lot of jazz bands but please support uh, local you know, musicians. If you can't actually go see them in person, uh, download their music and just have a night, you know, staying at home indoors, having a nice cocktail, nice whiskey, nice wine, and listening to some really great jazz. That's my, my two cents. I love this because like I, you know, I'm, I'm very aware that a New York Sour, excuse me, uh, yes, New York Sour exists, um, but I, it didn't occur to me to ever try to actually make a cocktail with the whiskeys and the wines, which seems kind of like silly, but a lot of times with the, the Dalmore specifically, because of the sherry influence, we will make a sherry and Dalmore cocktail because the, all the flavors are, are present in it. But I am so excited to try this. I mean, Don, like, I, I'm gonna get like, from, from this tasting tonight, I'm gonna like run over to my little bar and be like, let's try a new thing. But you know, I wonder, do you know the history, Don, I'm not to put you on the spot, of why in particular uh, the New York Sour does do the, the wine floater? Like well, how that came to be? Because I, I need to look this up because I, I do not. That I'm not actually sure. I know it dates back to about the 1880s. Um, and I know back then they would do a lot of different cocktails with a red wine or a sherry or a port float uh, mm -hmm. on top. Um, and even some of the uh, the modern, well, not modern, but like the the tropical cocktails, sticky cocktails, like uh, fog cutters, have floats of uh, cream sherry on top. Uh, so who first started it? Um, no, I don't. I don't know if anybody. Maybe maybe Dave Wanderich knows the history of that. But as far as I know, um, and it was always American whiskey. But I know there are Scotch sours that I've liked, mostly. Um, with blended scotch. I, I never really used a single malt before, but I think this works very well because it's not um, overly smoky like an, like an Isla. Uh, I think the smoke might, might kill this, but with the Jura Sevenwood um, and this particular wine, it just, it just really comes together really well. They're, they're not um, like opposites going together. They're very complementary. I'd say. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the vintage lifestyle. And this sounds kind of silly, but <laughs> I met you originally because you were hosting an event series called Club Witsend. Yes. And uh, as someone who is naturally theatrical, I like to dress up and like, you know, come to fun parties and have great cocktails. Um, but I'm very curious, uh, you know, I've attended a couple of your Green Fairy um, digital or digital, is, is that the word I'm looking for? Um, on screen events, but how is the vintage community pivoting right now to still engage and hang out together and like enjoy um, collaboration in the current you know, world that we're in? Um, you, the Green Fairy is doing some amazing things. And uh, I, I'm just curious how every time you curate one of those Green Fairies, like how are, how are you bringing these people together? Oh, well, that's a good question because uh, what we've been doing, beca because we would have everything monthly in a, uh, another intimate speakeasy, it's, it's, which actually used to be a, a speakeasy, uh, called the Red Room. It's above KGB Bar in the East Village. And it was, uh, I think Luciano had it as a speakeasy, but it was a small intimate club where we would 
uh, charge people to come in and, and do absinthe tastings. And since we can't do that, what we've been doing is having monthly parties online where people can either watch for free or donate to the performers. And this is to help support the performers. I want to keep the performers, uh, you know, support it while we can't actually meet in person. Uh, and the nice thing about that is that that actually has opened it up so that we can have performers and do things like this, where we can have uh, performers who are outside of New York. You know, prior to this, when we were doing the live shows, everybody had to be in New York or schedule a time to come. And now I can have a performer from Los Angeles or performer from New Orleans or, you know, all that, which is a very nice thing. And as far as the live things go, um, this past summer and fall, what most people who are into this kind of, you know, dressing up and having a nice night or day have been doing is going to uh, Central Park and having socially distant picnics where everybody would bring their, you know, their gingham cloth and, and their picnic baskets and their wines and whatever. And there'd be jazz bands, you know, playing uh, either monthly or, or weekly. And we could all listen to live jazz and see each other or walk over and talk to each other. So I don't know what's going to happen now that it's getting colder and it's going to be really, really cold. Um, I do have one event planned for Brooklyn uh, for December 5th, which is going to be repeal day. It'll be our sixth annual one. And we're going to have to make sure everybody's socially distant and, and see how that goes. Um, but yeah, people are just coping and, you know, the rules are changing uh, on an almost daily basis. And we just have to constantly keep adapting. I don't know what's going to happen, you know, next month. It's going to sound kind of silly, but for those who are not so familiar with Cocktail Land, do you mind explaining what repeal day is? Oh, yes, of course. Okay, so um, a lot of people know that in America from 1920 to 1933, we had prohibition, which meant that uh, any spirits, uh, alcohol uh, were, well, well, they were forbidden. It was against the law to, uh, to sell them. <laughs> and uh, there, there were ways around it, but it was what made uh, bootlegging very popular. It's what gave rise to organized crime. So they finally uh, shut it down. And the day of repeal was December 5th, 1933. So for the past, uh, four years, this will be our fifth one, uh, we've been celebrating on repeal day, the, you know, the repeal prohibition uh, with different bars in New York doing uh, discounts or specials on cocktails or having uh, live jazz bands. We're going to be doing it at uh, Bowers and Tents uh, Ginger Liqueur. They have a tasting room and there's uh, Standard Wormwood Distillery and New York Distilling is doing some stuff. Uh, they make fantastic gins and rice. Thank um, you. But uh, yeah, we're just, oh, and I just wanted to mention, uh, I think I do actually remember the very first time I met you wasn't when you came to Wit's End, although you used to come there, but it was for a vocal competition at Don't Tell Mama, I think. Oh Lord, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I used to host a, a show called mm -hmm. The Big Net Out. Um, that was a variety cabaret show in New York City. And we had, uh, was it 1930s Idol? 1920s Idol. That's what it was, it was 1930s Idol, yes. Yeah, yes. So it was a, a series of really talented vocalists that had to come in and actually present a song of the, I, I think we opened the, the rules from like a song from 1920 to 1935, but that like, you know, in, in the most pure and honest and of the time way that they positively could. And um, the winner was Danielle Friedman, uh, who is a very talented singer and sang, um, oh, be uh, the Bedlam song. Mm. I can't remember what it was called. She was fantastic. Yeah. That either, yeah. Yeah, she was, she was a beautiful, funny, very talented vocalist. So yes, maybe I think that was the first time. God, that was like, oh, I want to say that was, 2006? Yeah, I think you may have been coming to Wits End prior, yeah. but the first time I actually got to like meet you and hang out with you and talk to you because usually when I was hosting Wits End, it was such a, a whirlwind uh, that, you know, I would say hi to everybody, but only talk to each person for 
you know, five seconds because um, I'm running around behind the scenes and making sure that all the fires are being put out. Uh, but I remember getting to know you then. And then every time you came after to Witsand, it was like, oh, hey, you know, hi, Jen, how are you doing? So. Uh, one of my most distinct memories, I, I feel like the long and the short of it, and I apologize, Beth, has been a series of just my, like my coming out parties of how weird I am, but <laughs> let's go with it. Um, but like, I remember the distinct uh, pleasure and um, honor of eating a donut off the floor at, at Woot when there was the donut eating contest and winning. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You didn't know you did it off the floor. What, what was happening was the contest was based on these old contests they had in the 20s where two people would hold a, a cord or a string and there was, uh, you know, a six, how, a dozen donuts, you know, on the string. And each person would get a donut and try to have to eat the donut off of the string without it, you know, crashing to the floor and falling. And uh, Jen won that competition. <laughs> I sure did. Um, I was much younger and blonder then. <laughs> um, oh. But, oh, oh yes, ma'am. Oh yes, ma'am. This is before you, but you didn't know me when. Um, but that being said, um, you know, Beth, I'm so curious. When we talk about this vintage lifestyle, um, in Seattle, um, there have been so many events that have had to be put off, of course, because of COVID. But do you, are you seeing a... Um, a current interest in this world? Are you seeing people that are uh, enjoying dressing up in fancy clothes and attending these things to the best of their ability? Is there a virtual space you're aware of? Well, I mean, I will go back to, um, oh, I just forgot his name. He did thrift shop. Um, thrift shop. The rapper. Oh, 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 um, uh, oh, yep. mm. Right. Well, get it, get it in a moment. It'll come. Yes. Is that like, I moved to Seattle in 91 when I came up for college. I'm going to date myself. Um, I started thrifting and it was totally part of the grunge scene. Macklemore. Thank you. Yes. Yes. My brain is a little slow these days. Um, so I was thrifting from the beginning because that's just what you did. Um, and then, you know, you class up maybe a little bit and you're vintage shopping um because you're buying something from you know the 40s 50s you know and going back um there's definitely a scene here a huge scene i mean it's not just macklemore tapped on it just as it was actually probably after its apex so it was like, uh, yeah, yeah, we've been doing it for a while, for at least 20 years before you say, you made a, made a great song about it and made a lot of money off of it. Um, there was this amazing salon and it was a late night salon. It started at one o'clock in the morning. And I remember one particular night, I wiggled myself into a Stella McCartney dress and it's the only time I've ever fit into it. <laughs> Wait a second, because in our in our official, like the, the thing we put out every week that's like, watch our show, you're wearing a Stella McCartney jumper, aren't you? Oh, I am, yes, thank you yeah. for mentioning that. Um, that's the one Stella McCartney piece I can wear. This other one was free children. <laughs> and it's actually a little bit more like va va boom. And I wore it to this, you know, this, late night speakeasy slash salon slash whatever. Um, we went in, everyone is in vintage, different eras. There is a guy driving or riding a little tricycle with, um, oh God, some sort of, uh, I can't even think of the name of the hat, but some sort of weird little hat on his head around this vintage apartment. And it was just, oh yeah, no, it was, yeah, it was amazing. It was weird. It was surreal. Very David Lynchian. I mean, Twin Peaks, that was filmed here, so it makes sense. Um, no, there's a huge vintage scene here. Um, we we wear it out. It's our everyday. I have a 40s Balmain um, suit that I wear out for tastings. I have a three-piece 1938 men's suit that I wear out all the time for events and whatnot, or, you know, back when we had those. 
Um, there's a huge scene here. It's really, it's actually quite beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Old Seattle's like that. There is the new techie Seattle, which is a little bit different, but old Seattle, we have it. I used to go vintage shopping up on um, Capitol Hill quite a bit. Yes. And anytime I was in, in Seattle, um, like actually right now, one of the things that went from being live to virtual is this week is, is BurleyCon, which is like a world's mm -hmm. uh, burlesque convention, but it's all academic, it's all classes, and it's always been in Seattle, but now they're doing a virtual week. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going to, to the triple door to see the weird cabarets or yeah. uh, swing dancing with the big bands of, uh, at Oddfellows, mm -hmm. you know, um, Circus Contraption was great. Uh, there was a lot of new vaudeville happening in Seattle, which was amazing mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so Don, um, we mentioned earlier in the live cast about your photography, but you have been one of the foremost, pho I can't even say that, photographers. Um, <laughs> I know it's like an easy word, but it's fine. Um, for, for burlesque for a long time, and you've captured some of the most talented artists in America, in Europe. Um, there is not a person I know in burlesque who doesn't know your name, even now. Um, should I talk a little bit about that? Uh, no. no actually, <laughs> He's like, no, no. <laughs> to talk about that because um, that started, and, and I'm really proud that I was able to do it, um, at, at least start out early when nobody else was doing it. Now, fortunately, there are other people doing it and I could just enjoy shows. Um, but I, I got into that because I was doing you know, my day job was, was working film and television, doing lighting and camera work. And when I wasn't uh, working on a show, I was doing stills, mostly, you know, for myself. But then I started shooting for my friends and they were all entertainers, uh, you know, actors and musicians. I was doing album covers and uh, a lot of people were doing vaudeville and burlesque. And this is, you know, like late 90s, early 2000s. Um, so I started shooting their shows. And then we went to New Orleans in 2001 for a big convention. And I found out other people were doing it in other cities besides Los Angeles and got to meet them. And then if I was in their town, I, I would you know, shoot pictures for them or if they came to LA. Um, a lot of times I, I spent in New York and shot the New York performers. But uh, yeah, I, I, this was in the days of shooting film, uh, which is why not too many people you know, were shooting. It was a little, little expensive. Um, when things switched to digital, uh, more people got into it, which I think is very cool because my whole point was to uh, document things. I was trained as a documentary filmmaker. So I am I'm lucky that I have, I was in the right place at the right time, that I have documentation going back to, you know, the days uh, when Neo Burlesque was starting. And through that, I actually got to go to Exotic World in Vegas, which is a burlesque museum. Well, it was in Hellendale, California. We helped move it to uh, Las Vegas. Now it's the Burlesque Hall of Fame. But through that, I got to meet the older performers who were doing it back in the 40s and 50s and 60s and got to take some pictures of them. So it, it's just been a lot of fun um, getting to see, you know, your friends change the world, I, I guess you'd say, by bringing burlesque back and doing this big revival for it. What I think is so fascinating is that, um, and I know if you run in spirit circles, some of this is a bit cliche at this point. Like, like there was a Halloween costume that was like 90s bartender and it was like, whatever. But at the time when all of this was happening, especially when I first met you, Don, mm -hmm. um, there was this symbiosis between live performance, burlesque performance, vaudeville performance, and the revival of classic cocktails. And it was all happening at the same time. And, and New York was at the forefront of this. Um, and you're talking about venues like Flute, like, um, oh God, I'm Sasha Petrasks. I can't think of it. Uh, uh, Milk and Honey, thank you. Um, but like, you're, you're looking at all these places that were embracing this idea of classic cocktails done simplistically, but also in symbiosis with performance like the slipper room mm -hmm. or like uh I mean flute for wit's end or like red room or I was trying to think of like what is the place where Ashton and Dandy used to perform it was all white Hyde Park 
Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all of this was happening at the same time. And now I think we, in our cynical eyes of, you know, 2020, we look at this all as very cliche. It's like the bartender wears suspenders and has the mustache. But at the time, like all of this was really revitalizing the cocktail movement. It was revitalizing the live performance movement. And it was happening in the symbiotic way that you would go to a place like Hyde Park. Mm -hmm. And not only would you experience these cutting edge, delightful cocktails, but you were, you, there was a floor show. Mm -hmm. And this was something that had not been present or available in New York City for, for probably about 20 years because there was live music, there, there were opportunities to go to venues, but the, but the combination of the quality of service plus the quality of entertainment was singular to the years. I mean, I would probably say between 2010 to 2013, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And it's very funny that, um, you know, I'm very much West Coast, Best Coast. Like I love the weather out here, but I will say that the, I'm gonna get a lot of bad emails for this, but the, the West Coast response to the East Coast resurgence of what hospitality means was slow and it took it it took a little bit of time for them to get on board for what it meant to have a floor show plus a cocktail show mm, I, I know okay beth argue with me step back a little bit and i'm saying excuse me give me your hot take beth um seattle burlesque we have a long history yes fair fair and i worked at i worked at el gaucho seattle and we had the the original location, because the new location just opened. Um, the original location was the Longshoremen's Union Hall. Mm -hmm. Long history. When Paul McKay bought the establishment um, in the 90s, well, actually, the, oh God, time escapes me now. Uh, we'll say, yeah, the 90s. He bought it, he reopened El Gaucho from, like the original incarnation. Um, it stood there for many years and I worked there for almost nine years. Uh, we did burlesque shows down in the Pampas room. And this would have been, um, we started, I left in, gosh, 2013. So we did two years of burlesque shows before I left and would have continued on after I left. Um, and we were doing cocktails, but we were doing high-end burlesque and it was beautiful and extremely classy. And it was bringing the attention to the art form and whatnot. So I would say that New York, always the bellwether, but we were, we were doing it. So it wasn't just you guys. I would say that maybe, maybe we weren't hitting on the classic cocktails just yet but we were hitting on the classic burlesque. Can I just jump in here quick? Um, yes, of course. I think you're both right. Um, one of the things I, I have about Seattle burlesque is, um, unlike a lot of other places you go, is that all the burlesque in Seattle that I've seen is high end. And I know a lot of performers in there um, from, from way back in the day, but Seattle burlesque is almost like its own unique thing. Um, it's, it's really serious. They have a lot of crowds that keep coming week after week being the same crowds and the cocktail, I mean, everything from the zigzag to now, you know, Canon, um, it's, it's its own. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Scene. Um, but I think Jen, what you were saying about New York and LA uh, is valid, especially for the cocktails because the, the craft cocktail scene uh, in the US maybe it didn't start in New York, but it really picked up. It, it started everywhere kind of at the same time, but New York is really the the, the forefront, I'd say, of making it with Sasha and, and Dale DeGroff and all that. But bringing back the classic cocktails and getting rid of the Fern Bar stuff. Um, and that took a long time to get to Los Angeles. Los Angeles already had some fantastic burlesque. New York had some fantastic burlesque. But the craft cocktail scene took a long time to get there. When I had left uh, Los Angeles to go to New York. 
it had a different craft cocktail scene. Uh, they were still doing the 90s, you know, when I say 90s bartender, I'm thinking more like Tom Cruise. It was all about flair, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I mean, I hate to say uh, that, but that, that's like the most iconic image that we all have, like from 88 to 94 is basically like that movie. And, I, and it's, it's very annoying because there was a lot of things happening in the world. But Los Angeles did have its own variation of, of a craft cocktail scene that has only in the past two years been hitting New York. And that's because they had the the tropical bars. I know people don't really necessarily want to call them like like tiki bars anymore, but you had the tradition of the Southern California Trader Vic on the beachcomber stuff. Um, and that kind of rum bars were really, really popular in the 90s and early 2000s for the for the people who knew. Um, and now, of course, you have those bars in, you know, Chicago, uh, you know, Paul McGee's doing stuff and Lost Lake. Uh, and Latitude 29 in New Orleans. There's some great uh, tropical bars uh, starting to hit New York, but New York is really start, the craft cocktail people are starting to appreciate, oh, these are craft cocktails. They're from 1934, 1935 that they're, they've been reviving. So it's, it's an interesting cross blending of those two. And I just want to say, I apologize, Beth. I was not trying to denigrate the West Coast burlesque scene because it's amazing. Um, I, I think that that's actually problematic. I think sometimes we are East Coast centric and we, we forget there's a whole universe happening over here on the West Coast. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, what? Yeah, West well, Coast, West Coast. Well, so remind me, Beth, um, you, you, you're Midwest to West Coast. Is that accurate? I'm Midwest to West Coast? I thought uh, like you were, you were born in the Midwest and then are well, West Coast. I was born in I was born in Spokane, oh. um, which is Midwest and heart because it's a completely different animal. Fair. Fair. Love them. Love them. Um, but I am West Coast. I am, I am such a Seattleite. I like up and down, you name it. That is me. It's my people. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm West Coast. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, cool. Cool, cool. About the West Coast is that, you know, between Seattle and Los Angeles, you had San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And that was a big part of the um, you know, going to Bimbo's to see burlesque shows and the whole swing revival back in the 90s when, you know, you'd see these classic burlesque performers or large bands on stage but also the audience would all be dressed in like zoot suits and stuff. And that, that came down to hit Los Angeles and Seattle too. Mm -hmm. That maybe not so much in New York, but that was a big part of uh, West Coast uh, crossover between swing and rockabilly and the jazz bands and the, and the cocktails coming from that. No, it's true. I used to work for the Mountaineers briefly for a year, um, outdoor group, because I come from a really mountain climbing family. And um, they did a social event and it was a West Coast Swing and they would all dress up and it was huge. And this was in the nineties mm -hmm. and it wasn't the only place. Um, so just to support your comment, I mean, it really is like, there is something very much just about, just in general about Seattle, about um, genres and about celebrating it and about owning it and enjoying it to its fullest. And that that will never leave, even with like the tech and all of that. It's just, yeah. Well, on that note, we are at the witching hour. It is time to shut down the live cast. And I hate to say this because God, um, Beth and Don, I love you both. This has been an absolute pleasure, but I am going to shut down the live cast because everyone's tired and Don's on the East Coast and it's probably like, I don't know, what is it, 4 a.m. there? I can't do math, but um, <laughs> not true. Um, but guys, I mean, we have one, one episode left. Um, I am beyond pleased with um, the joy, the happiness, the thrill the springs every week. It's been a gift to my life. Um, I hope you have time to watch the next episode. And uh, what a fun time to spend with my colleague, Beth Hickey. 
master psalm. No, she's in the <laughs> advanced psalm. Got it. Um, and Don Spiro, a longtime friend. Um, but thank you so much for spending this time with us tonight. I'm going to sign off and um, give, of course, the usual ending. Um, but just like in a year that has been not a lot of fun, every week that I've done this show has been the best fun. So I hope you've had fun too. And on that note, good night and good luck. <laughs>